Okay, so that's your delirium, dementia, Alzheimer's, all those things. So sometimes in practice, for myself, I will encounter patients where I'm not quite so sure what is presenting. And for clarity, I will refer them to get a neuropsych eval to determine what it is. And this is why, like, when we learned about the different mental health, like the serious mental illness, the schizophrenia, the bipolar, that kind of stuff, we said could not be caused by any medical or neurological disorder. So you will notice as we go through these that some of them do present with symptoms that would indicate a serious mental illness, but in fact, it's not. So delirium. That would be an acute medical condition. It is due to a general medical condition. It could be caused by the presence or the withdrawal of a substance. Smoke some weed, you get delirious. You use some, drink some alcohol, you get delirious. The delirium is usually due to multiple causes or sometimes it could be not otherwise specified, means they just can't put their finger on what the cause is. It is generally reversible, so that's the key. It's acute and it's reversible. And usually the cause can be found. If untreated, it can lead to death. So it is a serious issue. It causes an altered state of consciousness and significant deficits in, in the patient's cognition. It could be rapid, it usually is. And all patients do not present the same as they can have fluctuating levels of consciousness. They're confused as to time, place, especially if it's nighttime and they're in the hospital and they're disoriented, they're closed and not sure what time of day where they are. So as nurses, we should work to reorient them. They will have an inability to focus or follow directions. They, they may misinterpret directions. So this is where therapeutic communication will be key. Their speech is often incoherent or they'll have aphasia or dysomnia. Aphasia will be the inability, them being unable to understand or express their speech. Dysomnia, they'll have difficulties remembering names or even recalling words. So what are some predisposing factors for delirium? The patient who's post-op, the geriatric population, anyone using sedatives, Barbiturates, drug alcohol use, hyponatremia, drunks, yes, those all fall under predisposing factors. Even patients that are oxygen deprived, dehydrated, if they have physical pathology going on with the brain, any fever, infection, trauma, also, if they have dementia. So those are all predisposing factors for delirium. So you're caring for a patient who is deviating from baseline. Delirium is something that you can examine to see if that is what ends Again, it impairs their judgment, their insight. So if their judgment and insight are impaired, what do you think the nursing considerations should be? Safety, safety risk. Yeah, exactly. This is not a patient who's going to reason through not walking out the door or sitting on the edge of the balcony. So this is a patient where you have to be sure you're monitoring their environment and monitoring their safety risks. Their sleep is always disturbed with an abnormal EEG. Then we have dementia. This causes multiple cognitive deficits for patients and it includes memory impairment. It could be dementia of the Alzheimer's type. It could be vascular dementia, dementia due to other medical conditions. It could be substance induced as well. 
or from HIV, a traumatic brain injury. I have quite a few patients who have a TBI and they do have dementia. And very often you'll see these patients with a one-to-one -one aid 24 hours of the day, someone that helps them with going about their daily functions. You're like, why would they need someone? Even though they're functioning okay, they look okay, but th their cognition is not okay. So very often they have someone with them 24 hours. I have quite a few patients who have someone with them in their apartments or in their homes through the night, throughout the day. It's almost like you have a shadow. Um, can excuse me, Billy? Yes. Hi, it's Bisha. Um, can you just state again um, what you were saying about um, it being vascular and then due to other medical um, reasons? I just missed that when you when you said that I, I feel like I missed something. I said it could be vascular dementia or due to any other medical condition. Okay, and that's where you were listing HIV and um, tra traumatic brain injury. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It could be Parkinson's, Huntington's scurria, just to name a few of the medical issues that can cause dementia in a patient. Has anyone ever had experience working on like a dementia unit or in a nursing home where it's prevalent? Yes, I had the chance to work in a nursing yes. home. Yes, yeah. only nursing 100. What were some of the challenges Constant redirection. Um, safety was definitely a priority. I'm, I, I didn't hear what. Safety was a priority. Safety is a priority. Um, yes. You definitely have a routine. You definitely have um, like the same caregivers over and over again for um, each patient, so that they have a, a certain routine. Understandable. It's difficult to get information about their condition as it relates to. I'm um, Joel. Can you expound? Okay. Oh, oh, certainly, because they don't have the cognition to reason through or answer your questions appropriately. So this is when you use who. Family. the charged family members, and you get your collateral information from them, most certainly. So dementia, unlike delirium, it is slow to develop, it is progressive, and in most cases, it is irreversible. So some key differences, irreversible, it is slow, and it's progressive. So there are different types of dementia. You can have pseudo dementia. This is a condition caused by another psychiatric disorder that mimics dementia, so it's not true dementia. There could be amnesic disorders where the patient will have impairment in their memory, often caused by a general medical condition or persistent substance use. You hear people make the joke that you're drinking your brains out. Here you go. So if you're in an interview with a patient, and I always remember that on this point because it was on my boards, if you're in an interview with a patient and you're talking to the patient, often the patient with delirium would be unable to answer your questions. This patient is often confused, frightened, angry. While the patient with dementia will try to answer your, your questions and often seems pretty unconcerned with making a mistake. The patient with pseudo dementia will not try to answer and will say, I don't know. So those are some key things to remember as you work with your patient with delirium angry, confused, frightened, unable to answer with dementia, they will try to answer, not even realizing that they're having difficulties, totally unconcerned with making any mistakes. 
while with pseudo dementia or depression, they will not try to answer and will, will simply say, I don't know. The next slide looks at dementias, irreversible dementias that are irreversible. There's the Alzheimer's type, vascular dementia, Parkinson's and Pick's, Huntington's disease, Crushville Jacobs, Lobby Body, the Down syndrome type. So you can take a look at those to see the popularity or different things that go along with them. So those are all irreversible types of dementia. The types that are reversible are those caused by vitamin D deficiency. And it's understandable as if it's a deficiency of vitamin D that caused it, then you correct the issue. If it's caused by depression, then we seek to treat the depression. If it's caused by alcoholism, then we remove the substance. If it's low potassium, if it's lack of nutrition or caused by a tumor, then we seek to treat whatever the issue is that's the precipitant. Then we have amnesic disorders that are due to a general medical condition. Again, substance use or it could be amnesic disorder unspecified. An amnesic disorder is characterized by memory impairment in the absence of other significant accompanying cognitive impairments. So they'll have memory impairment, unable to learn new information or recall previously learned information. However, the memory disturbance may not be transient or chronic. There's impairment in social and occupational functioning. And it's, there's evidence that the condition is due to the consequence of a general medical condition, substance, or toxins. If a patient has dementia of the Alzheimer's type, there are different causes, different theories as to what the cause would be. It could be some issues with the blood-brain barrier, being incompetent. It could be deficiencies in the neurotransmitters, specifically a decrease in acetylcholine. They could have abnormal brain proteins, or it could be a genetic defect where they're so predisposed to having Alzheimer's. Person diagnosed with Alzheimer's, death usually occurs 10 years after their first diagnosis. Dementia of the Alzheimer's type usually occurs in stages. There's stage, there's mild, moderate, and severe. In the mild stages, this patient will have slight changes in their, in their person, who they are, their personality. They'll have, they'll have cognitive losses in communication, as well as recent memory. There'll be some behavior changes, however, it'll be mild. They have sensory or motor functioning that'll still be intact. Their sleep will remain normal. They'll be aware of the depression and start using defense mechanisms. And some defense mechanisms you could see are denial, repression, projection, even rationalizing. Oh, it's because I'm getting old or it's because I took those medications why my brain is all messed up. So they'll find all sorts of reasons to reason through why they're having these deficits because they're aware of these changes that's happening to them. They will start to confabulate. And what does that mean? Well, that's a strong word, Tabitha, but yes, they start making up stories. <laughs> and what other population do we see confabulation in? As it relates to serious mental illness, schizophrenia. 
And this is why, as we talk about schizophrenia and you have patients confabulating, we can't just assume that a patient that confabulates has schizophrenia because the patient who has dementia also confabulates. And they begin to self-grieve. The moderate stage, they will continue to have a cognitive decline. They'll have some ideations of paranoia, again seen in, what, in, in which population? Those with schizophrenic, those with alcohol use, those with drug use. So this is why a thorough assessment is pertinent because you could see some paranoia and you're thinking, oh, he must have smoked something when the, and this person could be demented. There's an increase in, in, in amnesia. They'll have a development of language and movement problems. There will be some perseveration. And what is perseveration? Perseveration, going something over in your head repeatedly, not specifically in your head, but it is seen mostly with schizophrenia where the person will almost like talk about something over and over. They're like on this one track, just repeating themselves. I was gonna say repetitive. Yeah, that's themselves. So that's perseveration. Usually it's a thought that manifests into speech, but yes, it's thoughts and speech. So that's perseveration important for you to know. This patient will have difficulties making decisions. They'll start pacing, wondering. They'll have some behavioral problems. Sundowning. And what is sundowning? Like increased agitation during certain periods of times of the day. Like yeah. In the afternoon, sometimes it's a change of shift. Yep. And worsening of symptoms at nighttime usually goes into that sundowning realm as well. They'll have catastrophic reactions, which means their reactions to things will be grossly out of proportion to what is expected. Increased agitation, confusion, that is sundowning, yes. There'll be some aggression, some sleeplessness, refusing food, hydration. There'll be some self-care deficits. So it sounds like working on an Alzheimer's unit will take a whole lot of work because here you are faced with a patient who is aggressive, who's not sleeping, who's not eating, not taking care of themselves, using poor judgment, not recognizing yourself or your family members. This is where it takes a lot of nursing, that therapeutic communication, that effort to connect with your patient. Someone mentioned they have a consistent staffing, they have consistent routines because these patients will be probably easily agitated. So you don't wanna fluster them too much. You wanna keep everything as planned and as organized as possible so they know what to expect. Then this Alzheimer's patient can even progress to the severe stage where there will be a further decrease in self-care. They'll become dependent on others for total care. Their communication will be limited. They can develop secondary illnesses, choking, pneumonia, initiating, rather become initiated, have bowel obstruction. And this is why this is the patient who probably lay in bed all day, I'm staying at one position all day, good nursing again, make sure the patient is up, out of bed, up to chair, ambulating, because these are things we can avert if it is that we institute good nursing practices. Yes, it'll make for an easy shift if we allow that patient to just lay in bed all day. They're safe, they're okay, but is that in the patient's best interest? They'll be grieving, not just for the patient's state, but the family will start grieving as they realize they um, this patient has declined even further and has lost a lot of the functions. So your nursing assessment will depend on the history. As someone aptly pointed out, it'll be very difficult to obtain. So that's when we use our collateral people, family members, the chart, to get a good history. In our nursing considerations, make sure these patients have a quiet environment without distractions. 
make sure you assess the caregiver for their ability to care for these patients effectively. As we form a nursing diagnosis, remember caregiver role stress is a big one because if the caregiver is stressed, then that's gonna affect the care that they give to the patients. You wanna make sure you assess the caregiver's ability to also perform the tasks. As we um, say you're encountering a patient, you're not quite sure what's presenting, we have assessment tools we can use. There is the mini cog. There is the geriatric depression scale, the minimental status, the functional assessment stage and stool, a tool. So wherever you work, be familiar again with the assessment tools that are there. So as you do your assessments, you can incorporate them into your assessments. You can go back to your provider and say, I had an interview with Mr. Jones. Here are the results from his mini cog or his MOCO or whatever it is that they use in your facility. So you can more appropriately back up your assessments. This patient will continue to have a short, make sure you assess their attention span, their language, their memory. Start using name tags. Help to reorient them. Make sure you provide hydration. The patient is not eating. Make sure you have someone sit with them, feed them, or do they need parenteral nutrition? They're at risk for aspiration. Is the food type correct? Are they positioned correctly? Incontinence, make sure they're being changed often. I remember I learned in nursing school that bed sores is the direct result of poor nursing care. And at first when I heard it, it took me a while to reason through it effectively to understand that if we do our job as nurses, making sure that the patients are turned and changed on a regular schedule, then we can avert someone developing a bed sore. Assess for their gait changes. Do they need help ambulating? Do they need a walker? Should they be in a wheelchair? Assess their bowel changes and sleep changes so we can all work to meet their needs effectively. Safety concerns, aspirations, infections, injury sleep deficits, they'll have a disturbance in perception and cognition, so I want to make sure we address um, things that will present, such as anxiety, confusion, depression, even anticipatory grieving for the patient who's in stage one who can still reason through to understand that I'm changing, I'm losing my faculties, I'm forgetting things. This patient could be in a stage of grief, not just the patient, but their family members as well as at as it progresses or even as it presents. Maybe this is someone who was functioning well and then here you go, they're no longer able to go to work and do what they used to do. Another diagnosis could be a disturbance in coping and, and their abilities. So again, assess for the caregiver role strain, look at the ability to cope. Is there any sense of hopelessness? Is the treatment effective? Are the symptoms being managed? And if there is any sense of hopelessness, what would that give us a cue that we need to further assess? Depression and risk for suicide, yes. So you wanna assure patients have, are safe, close one-to-one -one supervision. You wanna protect them from their poor judgment. So you wanna make sure you have either taped off areas, you're keeping doors closed, doors leading to the outside so they don't wander off. So maybe a one-to-one -one sitter. Therapeutic communication, use a calm, reassuring, soft voice. Make sure you time your activities to coincide with their calm state. So if you know there is some sundowning going on, you don't wait until um, um, second shift to go in there to do your assessment or whatever activities you wanna do with that patient because you know this patient is gonna be agitated around that time. Empathize with the patient's feelings. Try to remember them as not just the patient with Alzheimer's but Mr. Jones or Mrs. Brown, whoever they are. Validate your feelings with words. Maintain their self-esteem and dignity. Don't just bust into the patient's room, rip their Johnny off to do your care, absolutely not. You, you greet them, you introduce yourself, you explain the tasks you're there to do, you 
try to elicit permission for as much as they can. I remember when I was in nursing school and we were learning and thought like, what's the sense of trying to introduce myself to a patient who, um, say for example, has Alzheimer's because they're not hearing me, they're not understanding me, but who knows how much is going on beneath what we're able to assess. And this is why we always, always treat patients with dignity. Even, even if they're no longer here, even if they've passed away, you still perform your tasks in a dignified manner. Respectfully use the patient's names and titles. So no sweetheart, no honey. Especially like in nursing homes, it becomes quite commonplace where people use those fond things, but try to keep your relationships with your patients as professional as possible. Avoid negative responses to failure. So no matter how small your gains, make sure you're praising them, even their efforts, make sure you're offering positive reinforcement for those as well. Your choices should be simple. We mentioned structures, environment. Allow the patient time to themselves. You don't wanna overload this patient. You wanna make sure you're pacing things and timing their activities so they have time to regroup before they tackle the next tasks. Do not infantilize them, pretty important. This is a patient who is in their 80s, their 70s, whatever the age. Make sure you're not treating them as, as infants. They're still adults who you should be treating with respect. Make sure you're wearing name tags. Try to reorient them. So there's a lot of nursing considerations necessary for the patient with delirium, with dementia. And it will take a lot of effort on your part as nurses to hone those therapeutic communication styles, to hone those skills to interact with these patients effectively. This is not the patient who's going to verbalize their needs. This is not the patient who's going to provide feedback regarding your interventions. Different treatment modalities for these patients. This patient will need OT, may need OT, PT, may even need a social worker to help meet their patient needs. Provide some therapeutic activities, music, art, games, things that they will enjoy or engage in. I remember when I was in nursing school, in LPN school rather, um, LPN nursing school that is, we would gather at the nursing station with the with the residents and we'd have sing-alongs. And that was a good old time. They enjoyed it. There was laughing. There was people singing. People who would be otherwise staring off would engage. You be that change. You be the nurse with a difference once you get on that unit. Some medications you'll see very often, trazodone. Um, trazodone is an antidepressant, but it is often prescribed. Who knows what it is usually prescribed for? Well, most times you see it prescribed. It's not for an, it's not as an antidepressant. Yes, it is very often prescribed for sleep. You'll see Risperdal, it's an antipsychotic. And you're like, but, but they don't have schizophrenia, they don't have bipolar. But remember, Risperdal is an antipsychotic that can help with the moods. And sometimes they could be having those delusions. They could be having the irritability, that aggression. So this is where the Risperdal will be helpful. They could also be taking Lorazepam, which is from which drug class? The benzos. And it's taken for anxiety, yes. They could have Depakote. And it's a mood stabilizer, again, for the aggressiveness. There could be Aricept or cholinesterase as well to prevent the breakdown of the acetylcholine, which is involved in the memory and thinking, which, as we said, it is theorized that could be one of the causes of Alzheimer's. Different treatment sites could include in-home care. They could be in a daycare, acute care, residential care facility, skilled nursing care, hospice. So there's a wide array of places that these patients could be encountered. And irrespective of where you work, there's a, a great chance that you will encounter these patients as well. So again, nursing care, 100.
therapeutic communication to effectively manage these patients. And that is neurocognitive disorders. Any questions? I must say, I'm in school right now and over the past week in class we were talking about this new online learning and teaching in this online format. And I must say, I, I thought I was the only one who was teaching who had this challenge and it is absolutely challenging to teach to a screen. Like I know you guys are out there, but I can't see you. And as I interacted with my classmates and we're talking about the challenges we all face with teaching the screen, we realized that it took us as, as teachers to dig even deeper within ourselves to maintain the enthusiasm and the zest that is needed to teach to a screen in silhouettes. It is indeed strange, Joel, yes. But it, it's the new norm and it gets to something else we have to get used to. So now we're gonna move on to sexual disorders and gender identity issues. That's okay. I'm getting used to it by now, Joelle. So as we talk about sexual, I know you guys are, because everybody wants to know what's on the exam. Mm. As we talk about sexual disorders and gender identity issue, you guys, you guys are like, why is this on our psych thing? Is this psych? But as we go through these different things today, you will come to realize that a lot of these dysfunctions can either lead, most often lead to psychiatric disorders. So as we go about our business as men, women, adults, um, sex is a part of life. Sex, it's happening. It happens. And if there's some dysfunction, with sex, it can lead to other issues. So sexual dysfunction, this is characterized by a disturbance in the process that characterizes the sexual response cycle or by pain associated with sexual intercourse. There are four phases of the sexual response. There's the desire um, phase where you see someone, you have a desire to have sexual activity or you're married and you have a desire for your husband or your wife or you're in a relationship, whoever it is, you have a desire. Then there's the excitement phase. This is the phase that consists of a subjective sense of sexual pleasure and the accompanying physiological changes. Men will have an erection and women will start having vaginal lubrication. So, that is, so that, is, that is what should happen. This is followed by an orgasm. Where in males we'll see an ejaculation and in females we'll have con contractions of the outer walls of the vagina. Then this is followed by the resolution phase. This phase consists of a muscular relaxation, relaxation and a general well-being, hopefully for both parties. So a sexual disorder can occur at one or more of these phases. So it could begin with a hypoactive sexual desire where there's a persistent or recurrent deficient or absent sexual fantasies or desire for sexual activity. So you have zero interest in sex. You're just going about your business and you have no desire for this. And as you remember, as we, as we talk about the different personality types, the schizotypal, schizotypal personality types, they had little or no interest in intimacy or connecting with others. So this is why we have to make sure we tease out differences. Is this person having a personality disorder? Is this how they are? Or is this person just having a hypoactive sexual desire disorder? So someone has an, an issue with a hypoactive sexual desire, it's gonna cause interpersonal issues. Whether it be if they're in a relationship or he never seems interested in sex, he doesn't wanna do it, is it me? So you're gonna start having some back and forth with their partners. So not only is it causing interpersonal issues, it's causing distress to that patient. 
patient could also have a sexual aversion disorder. This is a persistent or recurrent extreme aversion to and avoidance of all sexual contact with a sexual partner. Again, it's going to cause distress and it's certainly going to cause some interpersonal difficulties. So the patients that are having disorder, if they're having some distress in their life, they're being stressed, what are some symptoms that you could see occurring from the distress they're experiencing? of sexual desire yes and if it's causing them distress what how else could this distress be presented in anxiety depression anger so a lot of other issues could present as a result of them having these issues there's coping mechanisms. So they'll need to start using those coping mechanisms or they'll start using defense mechanisms as a result. The female sexual arousal disorder. This is a persistent or recurrent inability to attain or maintain until completion of a sexual activity an adequate amount of lubrication, swelling response, or sexual excitement. So you're in the midst of doing your thing and then you just lose the lubrication, the excitement. You just, of course, that's going to cause some interpersonal difficulties. The other person's going to be like, what's going on here? Is it me or you've seen someone else? So this can definitely cause distress. And at the bottom of each of these slides, you notice it says not accounted for by any, any other disorder, no medical or general or psychological issues. Then we have the male erectile disorder, a little more commonly known because of all the advertisements on television for medications to treat. This is a persistent or recurrent inability to attain or to maintain until the completion of a sexual activity an adequate erection. Definitely a, a source for distress and use of coping mechanisms or defense mechanisms, anxiety, depression. So this is how you can have mental health issues from these issues. I have one patient who um, I treat him for depression and he's very difficult to treat. He is always having suicidal thoughts. So I had to touch base with his primary care provider. And in talking to his primary care provider, I learned that he was having erectile dysfunction. He didn't share that with me. And this erectile dysfunction is, I knew he was having problems with his wife. But what I didn't know was that he was having erectile dysfunction issues. And after learning from his primary care provider, then I could better understand his source of frustration and his stress, and we could together effectively treat what was presenting. There could also be a female orgasmic disorder where the female has a persistent or recurrent delay in or absence of an orgasm following a normal sexual excitement phase. Again, it causes a lot of issues in anyone's life, as well as the male orgasmic disorder during a sexual activity. This person lacks the ability to have a normal orgasm. Shoot, Erin. Yes. Well, he did sign a release of information um, so I could speak to his primary care provider. So I could go back and say. And yes, he was able to open up and he shared with me that he was a little bit hesitant to share because I'm female. Maybe if I had been a male, he'd been able to open up a little bit more to me about what was going on. Like yesterday, my assistant shared with me that one of my patients transferred to the male psychologist, um, the male psychiatrist in the office. And I have countless patients, so many I can't even say how many patients I have, but the loss of one patient, I take it seriously. Like, why did he transfer providers? Because I would like to know, was there something wrong with our relationships? Is there something that I failed to do? Um, were, was our interaction lacking? 
So I, I sought to find out the reason why he switched so I could, one, try to make sure that doesn't happen with another patient, and two, if it was something I needed to correct on my part, I could start working on that. So I reached out to our office manager and I realized and learned that he had switched providers because he was having an addiction to porn. And he felt, he not having, he has an addiction to porn and he feels very uncomfortable talking to me about his addiction because an addiction is causing him a lot of undue stress and anxiety. And he would like to discuss it with his provider, but because I'm a female provider, he didn't feel comfortable having that conversation with me. So he asked to switch providers. So sometimes, you're welcome. As you do your assessment, you have to realize or understand that maybe if the patient is a little bit uncomfortable with you, not opening up, you can um, probably ask a coworker or someone else to try to delve in to see what's going on. Then there is the premature ejaculation. As the name suggests, we can understand what that is. A persistent or recurrent ejaculation with minimal sexual stimulation shortly on or before penetration you often before the person wishes it to be so to have this diagnosis we have to take into account the person's age their sexual experience the excitement phase because all of those things will play into having a premature ejaculation <clears throat> then we have this perurea. this is the patient who has who experiences pain during intercourse. There's a recurrent or persistent general pain associated with sexual intercourse. It could be either male or female. Again, it's going to cause them distress. Then vaginismus, a recurrent or, or persistent involuntary spasms of the musculature of the outer third of the vagina. So these spasms interfere with normal sexual intercourse, source for distress, or interpersonal difficulties. So sexual dysfunctions can also be due to a general medical condition, MS, spinal cord lesions, if there's any kind of neuropathy, temporal lobe conditions or endocrine disorders such as diabetes, hypothyroidism, hypogonal states, pituitary dysfunction. It can also be caused from vascular problems as well as post-op problems if there's like any scarring. So it is, it is good if you can connect with your patients and you're able to open up enough with you to share what's going on so you can help to treat the underlying cause if it's a medical reason. Faisha. Um, actually, that's what I was going to ask. So a lot of these um, disorders that we're talking about have a lot of like, you know, obviously that medical component. So if you're not, um, I guess, in a medical office and you're able to assess these patients this way, how, how else are you getting this information? So like, for example, the patient you had that didn't want to share with you um, based on, you know, he wanted a male provider. How, how else do you gather that? Or is there like a um, sort of a network of providers that are, you know, meeting up, you know, the medical record? I mean, I'm just not sure how you would gather a lot of this information. As a nurse, like if the patient is not sharing? Yes. Okay, so say the patient is presenting, obviously there has to be um, some presentation why they had that initial interaction with you, yes? So whether yeah. it be, it was for anxiety, it was for depression, or they came in for their diabetes, who knows? And as you go through your assessment, maybe you won't pick up on it, and hopefully you will, where the patient is saying, well, I'm having some depression, I'm having some anxiety, and say they do share that it's in relation to this. So this is where, if they're not sharing, you would make a recommendation recommendation how about you get into therapy so the the same treatment modalities we would have referred anyone to with anxiety or depression and hopefully in those sessions they will open up and share with their therapist what's going on and then in turn the therapist can say how about i reach out to your provider and then together they can meet those needs okay because so i have been, i'm sorry go ahead yeah. oh i was just i was just commenting that um you know some of the some of like for example um this um, vaginismus, vaginismus that you mentioned, it just seems like that's something that 
you know, unless you like tease it out of someone, they're not going to share that. Or it may come sort of like way down the line as an underlying cause. And I mean, I guess I'm thinking, oh, we just do the assessment and then we'll be able to, I guess, assess all these things and, and know it quickly versus something like that may not come out for a while. Or may not come out at all because it depends on the patient's comfort level. I have patients that I have been seeing for over a year and I'll ask them, are there any stressors in your life? And they'll say, yeah, but I talked to my therapist about that. So this is what, yeah, and then that's it, unfortunately. I don't know what the stressor is and I can't force them to share what the stressor is, but I can acknowledge that they're, be, that they're stressed. So it, it depends greatly on the patient's comfort level or how much they're willing to share. So unfortunately, we won't always even with even a thorough, well done assessment, get all the information we need, but hopefully we can still work at building those therapeutic relationships so the person can, so we can build those trust and trust and relationships with patients so they can feel comfortable sharing things with us. But even with our best efforts, sometimes we may not be successful in meeting their needs because it, again, depends on their comfort level and what they're willing to share. Like the patient who didn't want to share with me, and I've been seeing him for a while, but he said he wanted to see a male provider. And I had a new intake last week who kept alluding to his weird sexual desires. And after him saying like the third or fourth time, I'm like, so what is your weird sexual desire? And he goes, well, I am, I am aroused sexually by people who engage in food challenges. Okay, thanks for sharing. So that was his weird sexual desire. Where we had just met, we we didn't have a long-standing therapeutic relationship, but he shared it right away. So it just depends on the patient and what they're comfortable sharing. Yeah, or if they really wanted to start with that, because maybe they recognize it as a, you know, something different, or or like you said, he said weird, and just really wanted to start there versus. Um, you know, kind of starting off slow, I guess. I don't know. It just seemed like with something like that, you just, you, that's a, that sounds like you wanted to just jump right in. It sounds like the patient just really wanted to go there and just get it out versus, like you said, the patients that will never say. Oh. Yeah. I'm that guy had ongoing issues with his girlfriend, but he would never get into why he was having issues with his girlfriend. He was having ongoing anxiety, depression, and only to learn. It's probably because of his porn addiction that was causing a uh, rift in his relationship. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad he did come out and advocate for himself and say, I need to talk about this, even if it means seeing a new provider. I'm happy that he did. Yeah. So there's substance induced sexual dysfunction, which can occur after in ingesting any substance, alcohol, sedatives, cocaine, hypnotics, whatever the substance is, because of course, you're not at your best. You're not functioning at your best. And as a result, it can transfer into your sexual performance. Then we get into the philias. <clears throat> there is ex exhibitionism. This is over a period of six months where there's recurrent, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges, or behaviors involving exposure of one's genitals to an unsuspecting stranger. Has anyone ever fallen victim to an exhibitionist? Of course not. Well, oh yes. No, thankfully. And that was Tabitha who said yes. No, Tabitha said no. Anika said yes. Anika, would you like to share your story? Ah, oh, my goodness. It happens. Exhibitionist over a period of at least six months. There is recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving exposure of one's genital to an unsuspecting stranger. So the exhibitionist will 
expose themselves to an unsuspecting stranger. Like Anika said, walking her dog, pulls up in his car, and he's there masturbating. That is indeed a hawkle. Well, like you, Anika, I was in a car in Jamaica. I was in the back of the car, Monday morning going to work, stuck in traffic, minding my own business, looking left, looking right. Then I go, there's this guy over on the side of the street in the bushes, totally exposed, masturbating on the side of the road. To this day, it's been ingrained in my memory, and I still get grossed out every time I think about it. I have a patient who we had a very good we had, we had a very good rapport. He come in, we talk about little things, laugh and engage. On and then I learned he was a, arrested for exposing himself in a local library. I was like, wow, I didn't know he was an exhibitionist, but I learned. And since then, our relationship has been very strained, and I can't quite put my hand on it, my, as in to say, is it because he was ousted, or is he embarrassed? Like, now, when he comes in for his appointments, he's very, or even we interact by phone now that I'm home, he's very short, like, yes, no, okay, are you done? But before, he was jovial and nice, but he's an exhibitionist, and it does happen. These disorders are out there, and they're more common than we think. Thanks for sharing, Annika. Then there's fetishism, which is a little bit more publicized because we see it on all those TV shows. This is over a period of at least six months. There's recurrent, intense sexual arousing, fantasies, sexual urges, or behaviors involving the use of non living things. So it could be shoes, female undergarments, whatever it is. The fantasies or sexual urges or behaviors behaviors will cause this patient or this person clinically significant distress. They have a fetish. Then there is fraudism. This is over a period of at least six months. There's recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors which involves touching or rubbing up against the non-consenting person. And I guess my story is date back to Jamaica because this is when I was out and about most, I guess. But I was I was in college. And if you've ridden the city bus anywhere in the United States, you haven't ridden a city bus until you have been on a city bus in a Caribbean island. I can only speak for my own Jamaica. So the city bus is usually filled to twice its capacity. All the seats are filled. Plus, there are people standing in the walkway. So you have seats on both sides, and there are people standing on both sides holding onto the railings. And very often, there are people standing in the middle of the people that are already standing. So like three rows, you have people facing this way, facing that way, and then you have people standing in the middle. So if you have this sexual disorder where you like to rub up against people, then you're in Candyland. I was in the bus. Oh, that's how it is on a New York City train. I haven't I haven't been on one. Well, I've been on one once. I don't remember it being that way, but thanks for sharing, Tabitha. So I was on the bus and the bus came to a stop and I heard this huge uproar up in the front of the bus. I couldn't see what was going on, but I certainly heard. So they were dragging this guy off the bus and very angry with him because a young girl had stepped off the bus and he had proceeded to rub up against her and not just rub up against her, but he had ejaculated on the back of her skirt. And this was absolutely gross, but this is his disorder. I have a girlfriend who, who shared with me that she was on the bus at um, once also. And there, and there was this guy who was behind her and he was rubbing up against her and she like, edged him off like off me like can you back up a bit but I mean in essence he can't back up because the bus is full but he could reposition himself or move down some more and it went on for a few times after she nudged him quite a few times to get off her he pulled out a knife and he held the knife to her side and for the rest of the ride she had to pretty much stand there while he rubbed up against her very unfortunate very traumatic so that is fratricide that is horrible and awful.
Then we have pedophilia, which again is a little bit more well known because it's more publicized. This is over a period of at least six months. This person will experience recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies sexual urges or behaviors that involve sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children, generally those younger than age 13. Then there's sexual macrochism over a period again of at least six months. So this period is there because these behaviors have to be present have to be present for over a period of at least six months to be labeled as such. There's intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors that involve the act of being humiliated, beaten, bound, or otherwise made to suffer. We see these in on television shows, all that sexual machism stuff. It's a fantasy that some people are more drawn towards. And some people, for them, it'll cause them significant distress because they're embarrassed by having these urges and these fantasies. Then there's sexual sadism. Over a period of at least six months, there's recurrent intense sexual arousing fantasies, urges or behaviors that involve acts in which the physiological or physical suffering or humiliation of another victim is sexually exciting to that person. So for the person who has this disorder, what activities do you think they would engage in? Rape. Exactly, I'm Stephanie. Mark, I, I don't have information regarding who would suffer most. You're assuming that it, it would be males that would suffer most, like have most of these disorders? Oh, you're asking who? I can't make the assumption to say um, just like who it would be. I'd have to look at your research studies out there that have, I mean, that would be an interesting study, but then where do you find subjects? Because if these people, are distressed about having these issues, would they come forward and share their um, feelings? But I would say maybe evenly, but um, some of them are geared more towards males, but we talk about pedophiles, they're female pedophiles as well, it's not just males, but when you hear about it in the media or in the public, it seems like a male disorder, but I'm sure we have uh, female pedophiles out there, out there as well. Interesting, interesting point, Mark. Beisha. Right, quick question. Hello, it's Martin. Oh, I didn't want to interrupt. I just had a question about um, the difference between sexual sadism and sexual masochism. Since they both involve humiliation, I guess, can you just explain how they're different? So let's look at sadism. Again, over a period of six months, there's a current intense arousing fantasies, which is the same as seen in, in matrichism. The sexual urges or behavior involve acts. Involve, it involves acts in which the psychological or physical suffering and humiliation of the victim is sexually exciting. In matricism, this person enjoys the self-infliction or um, enjoys anybody else inflicting it upon them. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Basha, did the answer? Wait, wait so in matricism, the person, um, they want to see the, uh, wait, I guess I'm not understanding. They have they intense want, intense sexually arousing fantasies or sexual urges or behaviors of being humiliated or beaten. So they want to be on the receiving end. Oh, okay. Okay. And as it relates to sadism, they want to inflict those behaviors. So if you have a sadist and a, 
and somebody who's a Methodist, they would make for a great couple. Okay. So like, um, what's that movie? Fifty Shades. Fifty yeah. Shades of Grey. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and yeah, everybody brings that on up. Because I feel like the the cat, one of the characters, she was, I guess, um, I don't know. I guess she would be in, I guess, for self. I guess my my matricism or that was that his character. I don't know. I didn't really see the movie. I'm just guessing. I haven't seen the movie either, but I was brought it up because someone brought it up yesterday. It may be on my watch list for this weekend. <laughs> Did anyone get a chance to see the act? Oh, no. I know, you guys have so much free time. Oh, someone did. Erin did. Quite a few people did, actually. Okay, it's good to know. Then we have the transvestic fetishism over a period of at least six months. In a heterosexual male, there's recurrent, intense, or sexually arousing fantasies, sexual urges, or behaviors, which involves cross-dressing. This is a little bit more publicized as well. We see it a lot in TV shows. Then there's voyeurism. Over a period of at least six months, there's recurrent, intense, sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving the act of observing an unsuspecting person who is naked or in the process of disrobing or engaging in sexual activity. And very often we'll see on the news someone being arrested because they had a camera in some changing room of some store, voyeurism. So as it relates to transvestic fetishism, a period of these six months, intense sexual arousing fantasies, sexual urges or behaviors involving cross-dressing. So are they changing their gender? Not necessarily, but you can probably have a transgender who, well, if they, have, if they are transgender and dressing as the new gender, is it really the next? So there's a lot going on here, Joel. <laughs> yes, there are cross-dressers who, who identify as male, and in that case, they would be, it would be a fetish, not so much cross-gender. Yes, that is correct, Christine. Christina. Okay. Then we have the gender dysmorphic disorder. This is a strong and persistent cross gender identification, not merely a desire to be perceived as a cultural advantage or being the opposite sex. So they have a stronger, persistent cross gender identification. And I see this most often in the adolescent population. So in children, it is manifested by four or more of the following to be labeled as having a gender dysmorphic disorder. There's repeated or, or stated desire for cross-dressing or intense or an insist that he or she is the opposite sex. In boys, there's a preference for cross-dressing or stimulating female attire. In girls, there's an insistent on wearing all only stereotypical male clothing. There's a strong, persistent preference for cross-dressing roles in make-believe play or persistent fantasies or for being the opposite sex. They will even partake in stereotypical games or pastimes of that opposite sex. I remember when I just moved to this country, I worked in a daycare setting and there was one little boy. He was, at the time he was three and he totally enjoyed playing in the, there was this little um, dress up, it's called, it was called home living where they, um, they could dress up and play house. And he would always um, dress up in the dresses and at three you're thinking it's whatever they can, it's open play. And, but he would always assume the female role. I remember mm -hmm. his mom, he was an only child and his mom would share that his favorite color was pink and that 
she painted his room at home pink because he loved pink. And I'm like, wow, what a very understanding mom. And he was something else. He was something else, that little boy. And I left that job. And years later, maybe some, he had to be like 15 when I ran into him next. And I was working at a subacute residential for children with behavioral issues. And he had an intake there. And I recognized him right away when I saw the name. And when I saw him, he was no longer John Brown that I knew. He was now Joanna Brown. And he had, gr had grown his hair out. He had his nails. They were long, presented totally as female. And it was such an eye-opener to me because I, I've known this child since he was like three years old. And those mannerisms presented then when he was three. And... It speaks to the argument where it's always an argument for debate. Is it nature or is it nurture? What are your what are your thoughts on that? Both. Both. So are you saying then because his mother painted his room pink and went along with his desire to me was three, he had a propensity to want to be the other sex? I think some might have each part of it. It all plays a little bit of role in nurturing it. And then, you know, it's obviously if, this, if the, the kid is choosing pink, he's choosing it. So. But I guess there's no wrong or right answer. It was just an eye opener for me as having known him when he was three and i could definitely say he had these specific things that he was drawn towards and you're saying he's i'm i'm thinking he's three if he likes pink he likes pink if this is what he engages in he engages in he's three but then to see that at 15 he had totally taken on this new role it just opens up my thought process to say is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it a little bit of both? Or does it even matter what it is? This is who he is. I think it's just who, who he is. <laughs> like my experience, my I remember my cousin, he used to play with dolls and refused to, you know, they, his parents would give him those traditional or stereotypical boy toys. He played with them, yeah, but he preferred, you know, dolls. Um, which is interesting because um, my family is mostly um, male. And so maybe that was what it was different. It was like, oh, this is different, different toy to play with. And I mean, now, you know, he's this overly macho, you know, we have, we remind him sometimes, like, oh, yeah, remember when you were little, you only played with dolls? And he, you know, was, of course, he's a little embarrassed. But I mean, it, in, in the case of the story you're telling, you know, Maybe that's just who he who he is, who he was going to be, whether his mother nurtured it or not. And that is true. I mean, I have pictures of my son combing the dolls here, and I told him I'm holding on to these pictures because I know you're going to deny this one day. He's now <laughs> six, but I definitely have pictures of him combing the dolls here, braiding. So, food for thought. In adolescence and adults, the disturbance is manifested by a stated desire to be the opposite sex. There's frequent passing as the opposite sex. Like if you didn't know that he used to be John, you would never know that Joanna was John because he looks totally like the opposite sex. They have a desire to live or to be treated as the opposite sex. Or have a conviction that he or she has a typical feelings and reactions of the opposite sex. There's persistent discomfort with, with his or her sex, so their sex they were born with, or there's a sense of inappropriateness of gender in that sex. And they have a preoccupation with getting rid of primary and secondary character, sex characteristics with that sex. The disturbance is not concurrent with a physical intersex condition. The disturbance causes six, clinically significant distress, and it does cause him distress, and this is why he was in this residential program because there's a lot of acting out, a lot of anger, irritability, because 
he's struggling with who he is and then he's struggling to be accepted in society for who he wants to present to be. So it appears, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, quick question. So with, um, I know we were starting to get into the conversation about people that are transgender. Uh, so when there are um, patients that are transgender, are they sort of labeled or diagnosed with this disorder before transgender? It seems like, um, the, I guess this, this title is applied to, you know, the youth. And then as they get older, then it, does it go away? I mean, how does that work? If the title goes away? No. This, yes. This gender dysmorphic disorder, no, it, it goes um, through the lifespan. So someone that's trans, that identifies as transgender, would they, I mean, it's not always that they would have this sort of label on their record or anything like that, right? Or, or will they? No, I can't say yes. This is definitely not my area of expertise as it relates to the transgender and binary and non-binary and all the, the different labels that we have today. But no, as it relates to a gender dysmorphic disorder, it is a disorder that can be present in adolescent years as well as into adulthood. Is that what you're asking? Is that Beisha? Yeah, yes, yes, that's, that's, that answers it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And that is the end of our sexual disorders. And I must say that's the most I've heard you guys talk. For me, I work as a case manager, so I see a lot of different, um, you know, clients that come in that kind of have more, more of the um, sexual disorders and, I mean, or have history of it. So I guess I relate to this content more. Okay. <laughs> that is okay. I'm enjoying the conversation. That was a compliment. <laughs> so do you guys want to take a break? Or do you want to go through the last slide set? It is a, it is the smallest one yet. Was that a yes, no for the break, or do we go through? Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Okay. okay. General consensus. So now we're looking at death. I'm sorry, dying and grieving. So as we go through life, there are different types of loss. Some losses are necessary, some are actual. They can be perceived, maturational, or even situational. Net necessary losses are considered or to be an anticipated part of the life cycle. There could be actual losses, such as loss of a valued person or an item. It could be perceived where it is felt by the client and not obvious to others. What losses could that be if it's a perceived loss where the patient is experiencing it, but others are not finding it as being obvious? Yes, relationship or family or others, or even for the patient who is in the early stage dementia, who is realizing that they're having this loss and probably mourning that loss. And on the outside, nobody's really acknowledging that loss for the patient themselves. It could be maturational loss, which is an expected part of development. And what would that be? What are examples of those? Getting old, kids moving out, emptiness syndrome. So okay. would retirement be part of maturation loss? Yes, yeah. retirement. So these are all types of losses. A lot of people are saying, oh, I can't wait to retirement. I'm the one that's saying, I'm not looking forward to retirement. I want to go until the wheels fall off. I can't imagine having nothing to do, but that's what I say now. Probably when my body starts talking years from now, I'll probably say, I can't wait for retirement too. Then there is situational loss that could be in relation to an external event. <clears throat> There's a slide with different definitions. It goes through them. You can read through those. There is grief, mourning, bereavement, all different terms surrounding death 
or dying, palliative care, hospice, postmortem, living will, advanced directives, a durable power of attorney, an individual appointed to make decisions when the patient is no longer able to do so. And I do have a few patients, quite a few patients who have a dual power of attorney. I'll come back to that in one second, um, I'm Joelle. I do have patients who have a durable power of attorney because as they suffer from serious mental illnesses and they have these issues and they're unable to make decisions for them, you want to make sure you have somebody who is appointed who will act in their best interest. So Joel asked, what is a situation though? What is situational? So we spoke about some perceived losses. And we said perceived losses were losses that could occur. Maybe you lost a house, like, you know, the bank took your house or something. Would that and be? That, um, situational, yes. Perceived losses, as I defined it, it's felt by the patient. So it's usually not obvious by others. Say it's a divorce and everybody's thinking, oh, it's such a great thing. She got out of that relationship. He was a loser or she was a loser. They weren't good for, um, they weren't good for you anyway. But deep down that person, the party who everyone thinks should be happy is mourning the loss, the loss of companionship, the loss of financial support, the loss, those losses that others are not perceiving. Oh I, oh, I see what you're asking, Joelle. So yes, it's a situation, but it's, I guess it's situational when others can perceive that loss as against perceived loss where it is not felt or seen by others. So kind of intertwined in some sense, yes. You're welcome. Then we have Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, and I'm sure you guys have been exposed to this before. Yes? Okay, I thought so too. There's the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, the acceptance. Of course, not necessarily experienced in this order, or some patients don't necessarily experience all of them, but it's, it's, it's important to be aware of the different stages of grief because patients will present at different phases of this. It, it'll vary in time and intensity, depending on the patient. You have some patients who could be in denial for an extended period or in depression for an extended period. I have one patient who lost her husband and it, it, it had been well over a year and she still can't go back to work. She still has not <clears throat> made any changes in her home, like take his clothes out or his stuff from the bedroom. She is in this deep depressive state that it is it has changed who she is. So while grieving is appropriate, there is a time frame. I'd have to check my days in fact to see what is considered effective grieving and when it crosses that realm into, into something else. As one goes through mourning, there's a task of accepting the reality of whatever the loss is. They have experience with the, they experience the emotional pain of having suffered this loss. Often they make changes in the environment to accommodate the loss. As I mentioned, like she had not made any changes in her environment. She had left everything the same. They can keep meaningful relationship with the past while learning to move forward with life and love. So this is when they start healing. This patient in particular told me, there'll never be anyone, any, anyone else for me. I'll never be in another relationship because she does not see herself ever functioning or ever moving on past his death. And it has also caused a lot of discord, well, interpersonal issues with herself and her daughter, who's an adult, because her daughter cannot understand why is, it, why is mom stuck on this, like mom needs to move on, but this is her mother struggling with her own grief process. As one grieves, there are different stage, um, there are different things that are involved in the grieving process, such as one stage of development. As you grieve, your age makes a difference, what are some of the things in your development that you think would play a part in how you how you grieve? 
Your coping mechanism, obviously. Your gender. Is this your first time grieving? Have you been here before? Is this the third family member that has died as in, as against your very first? Someone mentioned support system. Yes, your interpersonal relationships will play a big part. Are you able to communicate your feelings? Do you have a support system? What is your personality like? Have you always been just an introvert? Or are you able to engage with others and work through your feelings effectively? Um, someone mentioned mental health issues. Most certainly. Um, are you already struggling with depression and anxiety? Do you have your own issues to address as well? Cultural and ethnicity plays a huge part in it. Is Are you from a culture where it is quick and you're expected to just deal with it and move on? Or is there a long mourning process? Is it long and drawn out? So cultural aspects play a huge role too. Spiritual beliefs. What is your belief system? Where has the person gone on to? Is there a better life? your economic status, your financial situation. How is this changing your life? How does it impact you? How is your social status? Did you just lose a husband? Were you the husband, the wife or the husband of someone influential or prominent? Does that change who you are now that you can no longer identify with them? In losing your loved one or someone else in your life, what else have you lost? Have you lost a house? Have you lost a car? Because you can't afford these things on your own anymore? Someone mentioned one's ability to cope, and yes, that plays into the dysfunctional risk, as in what else do you have going on? So, Different types of grief. Grief is normal, as I mentioned, but your ability to move forward and accept the loss is very important. There could also be <clears throat> anticipatory loss, which is it hasn't happened yet, but you know it's going to happen. Say, for instance, you were diagnosed with a serious health issue. You were told you only have A certain amount of time, weeks, months to live, you're already grieving that loss because you know it's coming. You could have a dysfunctional loss where it's severe and it impairs your ability to function. You could have a disenfranchised loss. This is when someone experienced loss, not acknowledged by others as well. It could be inhibited, where you've shown her outward expression or the typical signs of grieving, but you're still grieving. It can lead to further problems such as physical issues. And this is why being able to work through and talk about issues that you're having is very, very important. As nurses, we will seek to facilitate the mourning in our patients as well as their family. So while you work on the unit, on the cancer unit, and death happens pretty much every day and it's another day for you, remember, be empathetic. Effectively work through these issues with the patients and their families as they're grieving. We want to promote continuity of care. If the patient is on your unit and they're probably they came in for surgery or they came in and got this huge diagnosis, they're leaving the unit. You want to make sure you're making appropriate referrals. You're setting them up with community services to help them when they leave your unit. You want to make sure you're not only caring for them mentally, but also physically. Make sure you're meeting those physical needs as well. Assess them in honing those coping mechanisms. Provide emotional care for both the patient and the family. Advocate for supports. And of course, make sure you do um, self-care as nurses. Um, 
and this is something that goes under the radar sometimes. Like, I think I mentioned to you guys that since I've been home, I've had like probably four or five patients die. And I remember one day in particular, I had, it, it was a husband and wife that I would see back to back each day. And um, I called, when my assistant called the wife for her appointment, and when, as I was talking to the wife, I expected to see the husband next because he was still on my schedule. And she tells me, oh, I'm so sad, Zoe. I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. I'm not eating. I'm, I'm like, wow, what happened? And she said, John died. I was like, wait, John's my next patient on, on my schedule. She goes, yes, he died. He died from COVID. He went, and she starts giving me the story. And the tears just started trickling down my face. And my office manager, she's like, oh, I put a patient in that spot. No, you didn't, because I am not seeing other patients. I need this time to myself. It was just so sad. They would come in husband and wife, and they would always be arguing, oh, Zoe, why do you see her first? You should see me first. She goes first all the time. They were like children. It was an older couple in their 70s. But you could tell there was a lot of love between them, and she was so broken. She was so broken, and my assistant man just wanted to, Let's fill that spot. Like, no, we are not going to fill that spot. It was so sad after I, I finished talking to her. It was very, very sad to me. Like, I felt that loss. And I guess as we talk about losses that others don't see, I guess my manager, my office manager, it's another patient that died. Why would Zoe be grieving or need time away? I guess if I said my father died, I guess she would have said, oh, she needs the afternoon off, but it's a patient. She can see the next patient. So it's a grief, it's a loss that she did not perceive that I was grieving for. What happened, Beisha? Oh, there it is. I was trying to unlock. Um, so I had I said before I work as a case manager, I work specifically with um the HIV AIDS population. Yes. And so while most HIV positive patients are living longer, you know, some of them do have you know, infections, as we know, that disease process. And um, I had a scheduled meeting, so similar. So I had a scheduled meeting with, with this person and um, and he didn't show up. And then I got a sticky note on my desk that said that he had died. And I was just like, we work in this field and you let me know this with a sticky note. I just thought it was terrible, but, um, and it was very traumatic. I mean, like I wasn't close to him, but I was, you know, expecting to see him and I was, you know, having some things I wanted to share with him and some updates I wanted to get. And so it was just very sad. And, you know, like you said, we do have to take time to kind of gather ourselves in between because like I said, the person put the note on my desk and just carried on like, like nothing happened. Yeah. The day the death of a patient doesn't matter is the day I need to change my career. And I remember Back in LPN school, one of my instructors shared something with me, which I share with, with you guys at the end of every class, at the end of every session with you. I remember her name was Miss Daly, and she said, when you get into nursing or when you start practicing, you can never be too busy to let a patient die alone. So whatever unit it is you're working on, you know, at some point, John Brown is down the hall and the doctor says he's not doing well. He may not finish today. Don't just hang out at the nursing station and think, oh, we, we may go find him. Should, we may find him dead at some point. She goes, no, take your work. Go sit at his bedside if there's no one in there with him. Do not let anyone die alone. We cannot lose our sense of empathy. We can never lose the human touch, no matter how commonplace death may seem in our practice. And that is where we end. Thank you for saying that, Julie. You're welcome. And it has been with me. I've been an LPN since, well, I was an LPN, yeah, since 2008. And I have never forgotten that one thing she said to me. Don't you ever let anyone die alone. And hopefully you remember that as I share it with you too. Okay, so this is the end. Pam was expecting to get you guys back at, she said 11, 30, 12. Would you guys like to do some Kahoot or you've had enough of me? Do you need me to go over the list of things to focus in for the exam again? What are your thoughts? Okay, so 
yes, Pam usually um, in the past, she's told them that they can go back and look at the rationale. So when she comes on later, just double check with her because it would be your to, would be to your benefit to go and review those quiz questions and read the rationales. So the exam, it's not difficult. It is nothing you have never seen or that we haven't discussed or I haven't say maybe you should take a look at this. So some of the things I told you guys to take a look at, 